Welcome to the Founder Hour podcast. Before we get into the episode, just a quick word about our sponsor, Outer. You know I've raved about Outer before, and I love my Outer sofa, outdoor dining table, and chairs. I've had them for over a year, and let me tell you, they've been through everything from rainstorms to scorching sun and still look brand new. That's because Outer makes outdoor furniture that's actually designed for the outdoors, from using incredibly durable and sustainable materials to developing innovative solutions like the Outer Shell Cover, which protects my sofa and dining table against dust, debris, and dirt. No more soggy cushions or dusty tabletops. My Outer setup is always clean, dry, and ready to be enjoyed anytime I want. Head to liveouter.com slash thefounderhour to see Outer's range of outdoor furniture, fire pits, and accessories. The Founder Hour listeners get an exclusive 10% off for a limited time. Terms and conditions apply. So elevate your outdoor space with Outer. That's liveouter.com slash the Founder Hour. Here we go. Mark Laurie, welcome to the show. Wonderful to have you. Great to be here. And that's not a pun, by the way. It is wonderful to have you. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, nice to connect. Um, you know, congrats on a, on a big win last night. Uh, I was, I was watching and it's been so oh, fun. To man. That was incredible. I, you know, I was fortunate enough to be in, in Denver to see it happen live and, uh, the team just played extraordinarily well. I mean, yeah, a- Anthony Edwards is looking like MJ more and more by the day. I mean, some, some of the moves he makes, it's like, it's just like a carbon copy. I was, uh, he did that turnaround jumper, um, yep. right in front of me there. And it was, it was unreal. Yeah. So um, you must be super proud. Super proud. Yeah, absolutely. I'm a I'm a lifelong Lakers fan, so I'm rooting for you guys. That was a pretty brutal series. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I wish you would have, you know, took them a couple more games, but it was it came down to the wire, you know. Yeah. Uh I know you're an athlete. You you did track and field and you were on like a or you tried out for the US bobsled team. Were you always into basketball too, or was that just something that came later in life? No, it's funny, not playing because my height, you know, <laughs> uh, oh, you know, five foot nine wasn't, wasn't ideal, but I loved watching basketball. I was a big Knicks fan growing up since a you know, little kid and loved the stats and watching basketball and stuff. So it was always a childhood dream. You know, I grew up in Staten Island, New York, and um, parents had me when they were 20 years old had no money, you know, and, um, it was just like one of those silly childhood dreams. Like, okay, I'm, I'm never going to be a professional athlete, you know, not like my partner, uh, Alex, <laughs> right. but I'm going to, you know, um, dream about one day, you know, owning a team. So, so are you excited that the Knicks are doing well too, or you can't, you have to kind of compartmentalize that? <laughs> I have to compartmentalize it. It's funny. Like it, like a switch went off, you know, as a Knicks fan for, over 40 years. Um, and it was sort of like after buying the Timberwolves and Lynx, it was, yeah, the switch just went off. Not to mention they didn't, they didn't help your case with all the, all the games they were losing. So all right, that's true. That's true. <laughs> it was an easy switch. I'm sure. Um, Mark, you've, you've started and sold several companies, you know, worth billions of dollars. You've raised billions of dollars. Uh, you've even started or began to start a city of your own. So there's a lot to unpack, uh, you know, in terms of your life and career. And I just kind of want to take it back for a bit uh, around your early days. Um, you know, growing up, I think I saw in New Jersey, um, you know, can you share a, bit, a little bit about like your upbringing, what that was like, what family life was like, how that maybe influenced your entrepreneurial drive and spirit? Yeah, I mean, my my dad... Like, as I said, you know, had, they had me when they were 20 years old and my dad was sort of a, um, hustler, you know, he tried to make a buck, um, doing his own entrepreneurial ventures here and there. And, um, you know, start off selling vacuum cleaners door to door. Literally, he was a vacuum, uh, salesman <laughs> and, uh, I watched him hustle, hustle hard. He worked an incredible amount of hours and was really focused on providing for his family. Um, my mom um, uh, stayed home, take care of my brother, me, and my sister. I'm the oldest. And then, you know, when I um, was in high school, my mom, who had been never an athlete, never did anything in her life, started walking as exercise. Then she started jogging then running, then lifting weights. And next thing you know, she's a professional bodybuilder. <laughs> <And> this, is, <laughs> this is in high school. So it was, 
it was kind of wild, like, you know, coming into high school and say, Hey, what'd you do this weekend? Oh, you know, I just went to my mom's bodybuilding competition. You know, they're like, that's amazing. My, my mom, you know, my mom's like 50, you know, and I'm like, well, no, my mom, you know, she's 36 and, you know, she's, she's ripped. Um, <laughs> so it was, it was kind of cool though. Cause she was just like an out of shape, typical mid thirties mom with three kids. And then she became a bodybuilder and, it was really cool to witness um, her dedication because I'd never seen that before. I saw my dad's drive mm-hmm. in entrepreneurship, but didn't didn't know my mom had that kind of drive, you know. Yeah. So it was pretty cool, and I think that definitely influenced me. It had an impact on on me and, and my brother and sister because you know I've got an incredible um, amount of energy and and drive, and you know the work ethic is certainly there. And I think it was from my parents. For sure. And I think, you know, I heard that you weren't like the best student in school, um, but you could like turn it on when you wanted to, like, you know, if, and, and yeah. I think that, that that's like maybe like a shortcoming of, of school, right? It's like, it's like this one size fits all thing that's not designed for everybody and, and for everyone to su- succeed, right? Like you always, like you almost have to like play by the rules in order to do well in school. Yeah. I never wanted to play by the rules. I, I didn't, um, you know, I was the first one in my family to go to college. You know, they didn't take academics seriously at all. Do you think it was just like a lack of guidance and mentorship or was there something else that didn't, you just didn't feel like this drive to. I didn't feel a drive because I I was, I liked being creative. I liked inventing things. Like if you're in science class and they're going through all the formulas, that's just my head would just spin thinking about memorizing all these. What I wanted to do is understand like, how do you invent a new formula? You know, it was always like, so I would go off on my own world and think in, about a particular formula and think about how you can invent it. Of course, that wasn't on the exam, so I would <laughs> I didn't <laughs> right. I didn't do well. I mean, I often joke that you know I got a five on all three of my AP exams. Um, when you when you add the scores together, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously, like you know, school. We can go like on a tangent and talk for hours about this, but is there anything that you thinking back would have helped? Maybe like engage you more? Yeah, I think, I think the creativity is lacking. I think the ability to invent, you know, new, new ways of approaching problems, like problem solving, inventing ways to solve it and things. It was very much, I, I don't know if it's like this everywhere, but it's very much about memorization. Totally. Yeah. And, and, and reading and then regurgitating facts. Like I just, I think that is so overrated. Yeah. I've had this thought before and actually like a debate before about if someone with a good sense of memory or memorization, like that skill, is actually considered or perceived to be smarter than someone who is not good at memorization, even whether or not they understand the concept is besides the point. It's almost like the one who memorizes and can regurgitate, is that person perceived as smarter? What do you think? I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely fall in that bucket of I, I can't memorize anything. I feel like you got two parts of your brain. You have like the memory card and the compute and you have like, if you have more of one, you have less of the other. And that's just the way it goes, you know? And I I have a small memory card and, and, and I like to think big compute, but like, you know, I have to, you know, when I used to take math tests and things in school, I would have to, I couldn't memorize any of the formulas or anything that I'd have to kind of like figure out what the formula is and, you know, and, uh, and then you run out of time on the test and it's like, all right. So I got to, you know, I got to see on that thing, but I, yeah, but clearly you did well enough to get into college. Right. And you studied, I think I saw business and computer science and then went and went off and worked in finance. Yeah. Well, let me, let me just break that down for you because yeah. <laughs> I got into Bucknell for track and field. because I was fast, not because I was small. Okay. <laughs> That's the first thing. When I got there, I was on academic probation. You know, the, the track coach sat me down the first day and he said, you know, I have good news and bad news. I said, he said, what do you want to hear? I said, no, the good news. He said, well, the good news is I got you in. Um, <laughs> the, well, what's the bad news? The bad news is uh, if you don't get at least this certain GPA, you're not going to be able to stay here. <laughs> mm-hmm. So that was like my introduction to college, um, which, was, which was pretty funny. And then um, this uh, so-called finance job, Uh, So I thought, you know, when I went to Bankers Trust and I got there, I thought I was going to be on the trading desk with the traders, you know, doing derivatives and stuff. No, I was in the back office doing faxes 
and trade confirmation. So, <laughs> and the guys I was working with, you know, a couple of them, like, you know, you know, never went to college and maybe didn't even finish high school. So it was, uh, yeah, it was definitely a rocky start to, <laughs> you know, to yeah. things. But you know, like you, but you found that like when you applied yourself, you were able to figure it out. Like whatever the concept was, whatever the subject was in school, whatever it was in your job, like it was just like, it was a matter of wanting to learn it and wanting to, to be better at it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I love, I love the problem solving element of it, but I like inventing, you know, teacher says something and I'm thinking, 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 how could it be better? How can you reinvent it? How can you build it up differently? How, you know, uh, that was just the way my brain was wired always to do that. So it wasn't, it wasn't productive uh, when it came to exam time, <laughs> but yeah. it was certainly good training, I think, to be an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. That's what yeah. you do all day, basically. Right. So y- you went on to do really well in finance. You you were like the youngest EVP I, I read at the bank that you were at and making really good money. I mean, half half a million dollars, I think, like by the time you're like 27, 28, which is insane. Yeah. Like a lot yep. of people don't even get to that point. And you had reached like this level of, success that I think, yeah, like many people don't reach, let alone by, by that age, but there was something that like was missing. Like you, it seems like you just wanted more and obviously you, you went on to, to start a company, but I'm just curious what it was when you're, you know, that age making that much money, what is it that's missing? Like, don't you, it just seems like you have it all right. You had, I think you were recently married, you had a baby. What, what did you feel like was missing for you? I always think about, you know, are you a missionary or mercenary? You know, do are you and not that one's better than the other, but what motivates you? Is it money that motivates you in your job or is it the mission that motivates you to like really want to put the time and effort in? And I grew up a mercenary. Like my dad was a mercenary. He told me working is about making money. There's nothing else. The idea of a, of a mission was probably laughable, uh, although I never asked him. But um, And so, you know, I, I came out of uh, undergrad First thing I did was set goals. It was like, all right, I'm going to make six figures by 26, seven figures by 37, and eight figures by 48. That was that was my motto. It was like money, 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 money. Yep. And what I've quickly realized, because that's just the way I was, grew up, is I was making more and more money as fast of a rate as you could possibly do it. You know, at that age, and I wasn't happy at all. Like, had more and more money by all accounts, being super successful as a mercenary. Um, but just wasn't happy. I just wasn't happy. And I didn't realize exactly why I just knew, um, I had to do something different and I had always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I grew up, you know, as a four-year-old, I wanted to be a farmer because they grow stuff from nothing. Yep. And, uh, I did every entrepreneurial business you could think of as a kid from baseball cards to recycling, to car washes, to lawn mowing, you you name it. I, I, I did it. And, but I didn't have any money, didn't know how to be, go work at a startup or start my company. So I went to work at a bank and it was always like in the back of my head, this idea that maybe, maybe it's really entrepreneurship. Maybe that's what I was meant to do. And Mm -hmm. one day I just woke up and I said, you know what? I really think, I really think that's what it is. I think I just don't, this is, this is a mercenary and it's all about making money and I need a mission, something to like get behind, to get really motivated. And I think that is what's missing in my life. So I walked in my boss's office um, and just said, I'm quitting to be an entrepreneur. And it was simple as that. I just didn't know what I was going to do. I um, uh, He thought I was crazy because I just had a baby at the time. And I he said, you're, you're, you're crazy, but I, don't know, I can see the, the fire in, in, in you. I'm like, can I invest 50,000? You know, <laughs> he didn't know what it was. And he was my first 50 grand. And, um, and that's how my whole entrepreneurship journey started. It was just simply, and then what did happen was I was so focused on the mission of these businesses and just wanting to see them succeed. Like it wasn't about the money. I just wanted to win. I wanted the employees to win. I wanted the customer to win. I wanted to have fun doing it. And that really motivated me. And, and I, there was a fire inside me like I'd never felt before. And that propelled me. And then, of course, the money eventually followed, but it wasn't didn't follow as quickly as it did in banking. In banking, it followed very quickly and it was very exponential. And right. it wasn't like that in entrepreneurship. You know, it, it was uh, many years of being an entrepreneur before 
Diapers.com hit and we exited to Amazon. So, right. So you mentioned like, yeah, you had a kid, you were recently married, you didn't really have an idea, but you leave this re- really well paying job. I'm assuming maybe you had a little bit of savings saved up just to, you know, keep, keep you afloat for a little while, but obviously a huge risk. Uh, and I'm curious, like how you view risk, like what have you learned about risk? What are your thoughts on that? Because it is risky, right? It's a risky move to just give up everything and start something. Yeah. What was even more risky, you know, looking back is, you know, when I raised money for my first company, um, raised 5 million bucks and that was from like 60 angel investors, no institutional capital. And people say, how do you get 60 people, (laughs) you know, angel investors? That's a lot. And I said, it was really simple. I, you know, um, told these angel investors that I'm investing, you know, a decent amount of my own money into it. Um, I was pretty young at the time. And they said, oh, yeah, I see that. I'm just curious, Mark. Like, it's kind of a weird number. Why 390,000? Like, why not 400,000? And I said, well, because all I had was 390. So I literally took my entire savings over the first six years of being in banking, took the full 390,000, like literally the full amount, and just invested it in the business. Now, not something I'd recommend (laughs) and not something, you know, I would say, you know, the the next 28-year-old should do. But I'll tell you what it did do. It lit a fire under me like you can't even imagine. You have, you know, all your savings in it. You have a kid, family. Um, you got to perform. You got you got to do what it takes to to win. And I do think entrepreneurs, whether it be something crazy like that or even something less crazy, but still meaningful, where you've got enough skin in the game where you can't afford to fail. Mm-hmm. I think you have to set up. If there's a if there is an escape hatch, I believe you'll take it because it's so freaking hard. It's so hard being an entrepreneur. I mean, I say it's like eating glass every day and you just don't know if you're going to be cut on the way down when you swallow that glass. It's every day. I love that because you're a lot of people and we see this a lot have a have a big success, right? And then they go off and start other companies after that, after they've made a bunch of money and had the success and those don't play out necessarily as well and like, you know, because for that same reason I think your your back's just yeah. not against the wall. You have a big yeah. lifeboat, right? Yeah, you like a skip pitch like why why am I doing this? I have all the money. Yeah. Um I did well, I'm good. Like I don't need this. Like that's the I've heard entrepreneurs say this, you know, second, you know, time entrepreneurs and things. I don't need this. Mm-hmm. If you if you say those words, I don't need this, pack it up. Like yep. you're, you're not an entrepreneur, you're done, retire, it's over, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? And I, I hear that a lot. Yeah. What is the sixth gear and why is it important for entrepreneurs to know that? Sixth gear? I, I, this is a term I, I came up with, which is how to explain the feeling of when it, it's life or death as an entrepreneur, where it is literally this mode that you mentally get into where if you fail, it's like death. It, it feels that's the way it feels. And unless you have that feeling and, and know what I'm talking about, where that life or death feeling as an entrepreneur, then you don't know what six gear is. Because people sometimes say, oh, man, yeah, I'm in six gear. It's like, no, you're not. <laughs> you're not. Because, you, you know, you don't talk about six gear when you're in six gear. That's somebody who's working hard. They're probably in fourth gear. You know, maybe maybe they're stretching. Maybe he maybe fifth gear, but sixth gear, when you're in sixth gear, you don't talk about being in sixth gear. It's life or death. You know, you're, you're basically in survival mode and your body, your mind is capable of doing things that you never thought possible. And I just find that period of time, like so enlightening. It, it you feel alive. Like it, it is, it's a, a, um, it's almost like you, you, you've seen your superpowers you know, that were bottled up your whole life. And then all of a sudden you're doing things that you never thought possible when you're, when it's life or death. And I know there's stories in the world about people being in life or death situations that are doing things that you can't describe as a, um, with, with, with human traits or, or, you know, abilities, like you can't explain it, right. There's, there's been phenomena the people lifting cars off a baby. That's like, you would say it's impossible. Like you can't, physically do it but some something gets inside you that gives you like superhuman 
capabilities. And I think six gear is that it, you're, you're in a, in a position and you're operating at a level that you didn't think was possible. Yeah. And you mentioned investing pretty much everything you had into your first uh, business, which was um, the pit, which we'll talk about. But um, I'm curious as you've, con- as you've gained success in all these different endeavors over time, how have you been able to make sure or keep yourself in that sixth gear, right? As you've launched yeah. different companies and become more successful and then launched another company, like mentally, how do you keep yourself in that mindset? I think you have to, it really comes down to how much skin do you have in the game and skin personally, and then also reputation and, and, you know, in, in wonder, for example, my latest startup, I've put a tremendous amount of my own capital into this business. Um, like a, a good percent of my yeah. net worth and big numbers. Several hundred million I've read. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, and so um, it's all relative. It's a, it's, it's, you know, it's a, it's a big number for me. I, I can't afford it not to work. Um, I've also got every family and friend in it as well. And, you know, also there's, there's a tremendous amount of, you know, reputational risk too. You know, I, I've had two really big exits. Um, both of those companies don't exist. You know, like this, this is, this is the one that every entrepreneur wishes and hopes for. You know, I really believe that's that wonder is that for me, you know, mm-hmm. something I've been working my whole life for to have an opportunity to, to create a, a household brand, a uh, one that really has a positive impact on the world and, and, changes people's lives for the better. Like you only get one shot, I think in your life to really do that. And this is my shot. And so I'm, you know, can't let it go. But, but if I didn't put as much personal uh, investment into it and have all my friends and family in and all that stuff, like, yeah, it's been really hard at times. Like it would have been very easy to say, what am I doing? 52 years old. Like, I don't need this, you know, it never really, um, Cross my mind. Like it's, it's not, I'm, um, I'm, I'm in that mode of can't fail, you know, won't mm-hmm. fail and fail, won't fail. Uh, just won't let it. I just won't let it. I'll you know, do whatever it takes. And if I need to go into six gear and get into survival mode, I'm prepared to do that. Like that's, you have to have that mentality. I see too many entrepreneurs creating like this escape hatch for themselves. And, um, it's, it's too, uh, it's too easy. That almost seems riskier, right? In, in some ways. Um, so that we talk, we'll talk about wonder. Um, but going back to your first venture, the pit, which was like uh, this sports stock market, where you know that you started with your childhood friend. You mentioned raising like five million from sixty investors. Which I don't know how you even begin. The raising part is one thing, but managing that cap table, I, I felt, I feel like was probably. A whole different, whole different thing. Yeah, it's a I lot of chefs know, in the kitchen. I didn't even know what a cap table was. So we were <laughs> we had our first institutional investor meeting. We, we didn't get any institutional capital. We had our first meeting, and the investor I'll never forget it because it was so embarrassing. The investor said, um, "Can you tell me about your cap table?" And I look at uh, you know uh, Vinny. He looks at me, and we're like, "What's a cap table?" <laughs> and it's like they were like, uh, "Okay." Yeah, you went on. You've gone on to raise a lot of money, billions for future companies that you started, Diapers dot com, and then Jet and Wonder. Uh, what did you learn from that first experience raising money that helped more and more as you started to fund? You mean like the first sixty investors? Yeah, that first yeah, experience. So, yeah, yeah, one thing I learned. One thing I learned is investors love when founders have real skin in the game. I think I learned that early. That was big. Never would have raised that money without without that. Um, I think you know, this is obviously I learned a lot of things since then, but back then I definitely learned that. I definitely learned the value of, of having a good team, like good people. Like it's you know I think people in the early stages of a of a startup are investing in people, um, and they want to know those people are good and they're committed. And they have real skin in the game. Like that was probably the first learning. Customers are rushing to your store. Do you have a point of sale system you can trust? Or is it a real POS? You need Shopify for retail. Shopify POS is your command center for your retail store. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify has everything you need to sell in person. 
Get hardware that fits your business. Take payments by smartphone, transform your tablet into a point of sale system, or use Shopify's POS Go mobile device for a battle tested solution. Plus, Shopify's award winning help is there to support your success every step of the way. Do retail right with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at Shopify.com slash founder hour. Once again, go to Shopify.com slash founder hour to take your retail business to the next level today. So, so you end up selling the company to Tops, and then you, as part of that deal, I'm assuming you had to go and work there. Um, yeah. But then there came a point where you weren't happy again there. Like you were just like, I need, I need something more. I need something more. At that, at that point, I knew I loved entrepreneurship. We had started the company, grew the company, and sold the company all within 18 months, and just had the bug. Like I was, I knew that was it. I, was, I just was going to be forever an entrepreneur at that point. Yeah. And but I had to pay my dues inside of Tops, and you know, learn learned learned a ton over those few years. Um, but all the while thinking about what's next. And so you went on to start Diapers.com, and I know you've shared this story before, so I'm kind of glossing over because I want to kind of get in between the lines there. But you, you started it, and you know, Diapers, uh, they're they're a low margin business, right? Like you weren't doing it to yeah. make money on diapers. Uh, I'm I'm assuming you had a grander vision. Did you at the time when you first started it? And I know eventually you went on and had other product lines and baby products and then other companies selling other things like for pets and toys and that kind of stuff. But initially, when you started diapers.com, what was like the grand vision of what you wanted to build? Yeah. So it wasn't as clearly articulated as like some of my newer ventures back then, but I'll tell you the thesis was very simple. Um, we had, uh, I had gone online and, and saw that diapers were being searched in Google 200,000 times a month. And um, nobody was really selling diapers. Um, and I was a new dad and just thinking, that's kind of strange. Like, why can't you get normal prices for diapers delivered to your door? You can get everything else pretty much. They did sell diapers, but they were like ridiculous prices. So talked to some people in the industry and they said, oh yeah, you, you don't, understand, Mark, diapers are a loss leader for Target and Walmart. They basically break even or even lose a little money. Um, And I said, oh, okay, well, why? You know, oh, because they drive parents into the store and then they buy everything else. And I said, okay, well, so online, why can't we, we we do a similar strategy? And people would say, "Um, because you're going to get destroyed. The, The product itself is a negative margin. If you add on shipping, and fulfillment and all these other stuff, you're going to be losing like $10 a box. Like it's unsustainable. Mm-hmm. And so that was the original. So nobody, including Procter Gamble and Kimberly Clark, the big diaper manufacturers, thought this made any sense. But the thesis was if it's a loss leader in a store and you can buy 100,000 products, if online you could buy millions of products, couldn't it be more of a loss leader? Couldn't you lose even more in diapers? That was just the original thesis, um, and it played out. Um, like if you look at Amazon or Walmart today, they sell it the same price in the store and online, and they lose ten dollars a box online, and they sell a shit ton of other stuff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it was proved out. Now I would have liked to have been the one to have, you know, proved it out, uh, all you know, taken it all the way, but yeah. that wasn't wasn't in the cards. Given Amazon had other ideas. Right. Yeah. Like they, they approached you and, and eventually started lowering the prices of their own diapers and really like squeezing you guys out and really not giving you much of a, a choice to. And, they lowered the price uh, but, of diapers 30%. Yeah. I mean, I don't know who can survive that. That's crazy. Yeah. 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 So they, they were launching their own like Amazon mom and they wanted, I'm just curious though, like why did they want to buy you guys out? Why didn't they just crush you? Why didn't they just say like, we'll do it ourselves? Like, why do we need you? I think what happened was they cut the price of diapers 30%. And they burned like $100 million on diapers. And all it did was marginally slower growth rate. We're still growing. And they're like, wait a second. Like, there's a real brand here. There's a real loyalty. Like, what they're doing is special. I think that is you know, what they told us. And you had a great domain name, too. I mean, diapers.com. That's Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then we had diapers.com. We had wag.com for pets. We had soap.com for like online drugstore. We had yo-yo for toys. We had 
I don't know, maybe 10 different websites uh, that were all connected by our common cart. They were like specialty shopping experiences with a common cart. Mm-hmm. Um, and I always often think back to that, like, what, you know, what, where would we be today if we just, you know, were able to raise capital and not have to sell. But back in the day, you know, I think we were looking to raise a hundred million. There was like not the same types of investors there are today. Like you just couldn't raise a hundred million and certainly couldn't raise it with Amazon coming after you the way they right. were. So we really had no choice to sell it, but that was depressing. When we sold that company, even though it was life, life-changing, you know, numbers in terms of, you know, the sale price, I, um, and, 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 you know, my co-founder as well was depressed. We, we didn't celebrate. We actually were, were, were depressed. Uh, that sort of the dream, the dream was over. I mean, it makes sense because look, thinking back to where you were when you left your job to first start your first venture, like this mi- this missionary mindset and this like mission driven mindset, when you haven't fulfilled the mission and you've sort of been cut short of that, yeah. Uh, like you said, the money was secondary, and you were really trying to accomplish something, and you weren't able to do that. So it makes sense. And then so you went and worked at Amazon for a bit. And then, so there was this thing that I want to talk about, this like innovative piece that you guys figured out, which was how to optimize the space in the shipping boxes. When you were shipping the the diapers, um, you were optimizing for other items to include in the boxes that would, you know, provide an incremental, you know, increase in cost for the, for the end consumer. But for you, it was a big revenue opportunity. Um, That technology or that, that innovative piece when you went to Amazon, you eventually left Amazon to start Jet.com based on that thing, based on that same sort of innovative piece from what I understand. Why you saw these inefficiencies at Amazon when they bought you, why didn't they implement that? Why didn't they figure it out to the point where you wouldn't have had the idea to start Jet.com? I think, honestly, I think they were just growing fast like any startup and they had so much low hanging fruit everywhere. They were making money and growing fast. and you know, there was no competitor that forced them. And a competition usually forces you to innovate, and mm-hmm. they didn't. They didn't have to. So for Jet.com, um, you know, you guys, you guys are, are building this platform. You raised a lot of money to build out the infrastructure, the warehouses, the getting all the product and all that stuff. And then, like a year in, Walmart comes to you and says, "We want to buy you for like three and a half, three, almost three point three billion dollars, or something like that." Uh, was that, was that innovative, that piece that I'm just, I'm talking about around like optimizing the, the shipping and all that kind of stuff. Was that proprietary technology that that's what they were buying or like, was it something that they could have done themselves? I think at the end of the day, Walmart felt like they were behind in e-commerce. Um, going back this is, uh, 2016, um, they were, they were just behind and they needed some shot of adrenaline, something to put a kink in the curve. Mm -hmm. And I think they felt that we, you know, we had hired some of the best people in e-commerce that were working at Jet. Um, I had a long history in e-com. So did some of the other key folks in in the uh, organization. And they, unlike Amazon, weren't buying us to crush us. Um, They were buying us to uh, accelerate their own business. And mm-hmm. so that for us was very much further in our mission. You know, our, our mission was, was to create a formidable competitor to Amazon. Um, and Walmart comes to us and says, Hey, how would you like, um, to leverage all of Walmart stores? Um, we have a, a deep, uh, balance sheet that we, we can invest here. You don't have to worry about raising capital. You could just focus on execution and we want you to build this and we want you to combine Jet and Walmart and, and go after Amazon. Like, mm-hmm. so that was fun. Like, unlike the Amazon sale, even though it was short, it was only, like you said, a year and a half. Um, we didn't feel like it was like the mission was over. The mission was just accelerated with Walmart. Yeah. So that's, that's like two different, you know, sa- same kind of like sale. One feels terrible. One feels great. And it, and it was just, one was just about the money, and it was depressing. And in the case of Jet, um, the mission was front and center. Now, we did make a lot of money. So missionary mentality usually 
you know, are they mutually exclusive or they could they money. could they go no, in no, the no, same no. direction? The missionary focus usually leads to money. Yeah. Um, but you can't be driven and motivated by the money. You have to be motivated by the mission and then the money follows. And so I, I think I, I knew I was a mercenary when I was growing up and early in banking, and I really knew I was a missionary when I was depressed after making life changing money. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's, um, yeah, it's, it, it, there's, there's no right answer. I think you just have to find what it is that really motivates you and makes you happy. Yeah. So as part of that sale, you had to go to Walmart and again, stay there for a few years. You were, you were a president, I think the CEO of the e-commerce division and, and saw the market cap just like double, uh, while you were there. I'm sure that had a big role to play in that. And now at this point in your career or life, you're, it's like kind of like, mid, I think you're like almost close to 50 years old. And a lot of people, 52. Would, yeah, 52. 52, a lot of people would just like call it, call it in and just hang back, uh, buy a sports team and just, you know, chill and, and go to the games, but you didn't stop there. Um, and so now I want to talk about this like new sort of, uh, half of your life that you've kind of gone in, in this different direct, a somewhat different direction, but you started a city or you're building a city called uh, Tolosa, which I, I'm really intrigued by. I want to I talk about that and then we'll talk about Wonder as well. But I'm curious, um, this was like maybe a few months, I think, after you left Walmart, I saw that you launched Tolosa, um, which is like this proposed utopian planned city. What, did, what even inspired you? Where did the idea come from? At what point were you, did you start thinking about this and um, you know, where are things at now? Yeah, I think I mean, it just really bore out of uh, like frustration with how divided the country's become. And I just felt like at the end of the day, we're all human beings on this planet together. And we all want the same thing. You know, we want to be happy, healthy, safe, you know, good values, treat people right, you know, do the right thing. Like it just comes to some basic fundamentals. And and, and the country was so divided and is so divided today. And I thought, like, what is what is really at the core of the division, you know? And I think, you know, on, on the one side, people want to have these in, these incredible social services, um, you know, similar to to what we have in, in Scandinavia, you know, mm-hmm. education, free education, medical care, jobs training, affordable housing. And somebody's got to pay for it. And, you know, I think the other side would, would, would say, you know, um, I don't want to pay higher taxes, you know, to, to, to pay for the social services. And I think that's sort of at the core and there's a lots of differences and stuff, but at the, at the core fundamental core, I think it boils down to that. And I thought, is there another model for society where you could have both? And I read this book, progress and poverty by Henry George, late, late uh, 19th century economist um, who basically proved that the real problem is land ownership. Um, that, you know, there's a finite amount of land, people who own land basically have a monopoly and they're able to extract as much profit um, as they can uh, out of the land until people are no longer willing to work. And so by definition, there's always going to be a big class of people just getting by because the landowners extract all that value. And so I was fascinated by this. And I thought, what would happen if the land wasn't initially owned uh, by people that claim claim the land, but the land was owned by the community, by a community foundation? And so I thought, okay, we find land in in a desert um, where it's it's very cheap. The community foundation uh, would buy the land um, and then encourage people to come uh, live in this uh, city being created. But the handshake with the citizens are, if you come live in, in Tolosa, you will get the best social services anywhere in the world um, and you won't have to pay higher taxes. Well, how is it funded? Well, the community foundation that owns all this land will see incredible appreciation in the land if millions of people move to the desert. Like if people move there, and it's a normal multi-million person city, the land's going to be very valuable Mm -hmm. and the foundation will own it all. And the idea would be that the foundation, once it became an established city 
and the land was like a normal asset class, and you've extracted all that appreciation that the community foundation would sell all the land uh, and we create an endowment and as much as $500 billion endowment upon which they would earn, call it $25 billion a year, $30 billion a year. And that 25 to 30 billion would be invested in the best education, healthcare, jobs training, affordable housing for the residents that live there. And if people trusted this community foundation, because it's done such good Um, in the form of education and health and things like that, then maybe people would donate to the foundation to do even more good and create this incredible virtuous cycle. Right now, people don't like donate to the city, that's taxes, (laughs) but but they donate to schools and hospitals. So if you donate to the foundation, there would be certain projects that the foundation would identify, needs that, that the citizens wanted, parks or things that the government wasn't able to do. And the foundation would come over the top with these donations and, and use the endowment and the donations to do incredible things for the citizens um, of, of the city. So that was kind of, it was meant to be uh, a more equitable society. From, from a standpoint of like laws and regulations, do you think like a lot of the problems are at the city level? Like, be, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming I saw that the goal is to have it be like this multi-state thing where it's like, in, you know, kind of a part of it is in like Utah or Nevada or like, it's not like all part of one place, but as far as like the way that would work and like the government of it, uh, do you see that working well with the federal government, for example? Yeah, it wouldn't be, it's not meant to be a closed city. It's not meant to be exclusive in any way. Um, it's meant to be like any city currently in America, people, free to live there, move there, same federal law, state law, everything's the same. Mm. The only difference um, is is really this community foundation and all the incredible social services you would get being, you know, living in the city that complements what the government's doing. But if you're going to build a city from scratch, you know, might as well, you know, make it the most sustainable city in the world. Um, And you know, take a page out of the startup manual and you'll know, have a set of values and a mission for the city itself. So that people are proud to live there, are proud to know that they're furthering the mission of the city and that there's an incentive to do good. And if you do good, the value of the land increases, the endowment's more valuable. And so you get even better services and to yeah. create this sense of pride and feeling of like, yeah, like I, this is my city. You know, and and um, that exists to some degree, but not to the extent I think it could. And it's certainly it's sort of like the difference between being in a startup culture and a big company corporation. Yeah. How about aesthetically? Like, are these renderings pretty accurate that I'm seeing online? Or uh, like, I I love the look. I mean, like I was recently in Chicago and I'm like, this is such a beautiful city, right? Like the buildings, like there's an architecture tour that you do and learn a lot about these like the history behind these buildings. And it's not like these boring boxes that you see like in other cities. So, I mean, if you're starting from scratch, I'm sure you're thinking of it from that perspective too. But, um, you know, how, what is your approach to that? At least, you know, I think there's of- some, of, some of those designs and things are like, you know, the starter city. I think you need to kickstart it, but I also think it's important that it can't be planned. It has to be organic and it has to have a soul. And so it's really hard to, to, to get that done. And we've thought about it a lot. And, the conclusion we came to, and we don't know if it's right, is to sort of build it like a university class. So the first 50,000 people, you basically would, would, would apply and you'd build a diverse class, different occupations, income levels, um, different race, religion, things like that. Build, build a, a very diverse class of 50,000 people that believe in the mission and, and really b- believe in, in creating and testing a new model for society. Uh, if the 50,000 people would would move in on a certain day or over the course of a few months, like a university. All right, doctors show up and teachers show up. Every, and those 50,000 people basically moving together, it immediately gives um, the city like um, proper uh, density, you know, whatever you want to call it. So I think it was a few months. And by the way, I'm excited. I'm so excited to see how all of this comes together. And, and I know it's a big undertaking. Um, a few months, I think, after you announced Telosa, um, you announced Wonder or you launched Wonder. And I'm just curious, first of all, you mentioned you alluded to it earlier, but 
what is like the big opportunity that you see with wonder that doesn't exist today? And why do you think that the world needs it? Yeah, I think um, it's a great question. I think consumer behavior is changing. I think the younger generations are putting more of a premium on convenience and time. They don't want to spend time cooking. So, you know, if you're willing to pay a price for convenience, um, they don't want to eat out every night. That's expensive and it's not even that convenient. <laughs> you want to be able to eat in your own home and you want to be able to eat without having to cook and eat good quality food and get it fast. And I feel like the home dining experience, if you, you can call it that today, is somewhat limited. I mean, you, you can get on the delivery aggregators and order from local restaurants, um, but the time uncertain, cold food, delays, customer service is, is tough. And it's just because they're not vertically integrated right? It's the delivery is separate from the restaurant and it's really hard. It's challenging. It doesn't matter how good you are at it. And so the, the vision was, what if you vertically integrated? What if you were able to create 30 different restaurant chains, all different cuisines and managed to put them in one, you know, 2,800 square foot kitchen um, mm-hmm. and drop it right in the center in the heart of where people live and be able to cook all the different restaurants and be able to deliver it um, in a, to a to a home in under thirty minutes, hot. So would this kind of be like a like a ghost kitchen, like from the start before it's cooked or after it's cooked? So it's not ghost kitchen in the sense that it looks like a fast casual. It looks like a Chipotle. It's got mm. a brick and mortar. It's got some seating. It's got pickup. At wonder half the orders are pickup and half are delivery. So it definitely leans more delivery, mm-hmm. but it's not that different than a fast casual. It's just we've created 30 fast casual chains and we've built the technology and we've invested hundreds of millions in the culinary engineering and food science to be able to cook all 30 cuisines using just two pieces of electric cooking equipment. So there's no hoods, there's no gas, there's no stoves, there's no prep, no chefs in these locations. And so we're able to cook food really fast, really high quality, and we're able to order as a customer multiple restaurants in the same delivery. So everybody in the family can order from a different restaurant. It all comes, boom, under 30 minutes, hot. We won't deliver more than six minutes in the city and more than 10 minutes in the suburbs. Mm-hmm. So you're getting it really fast. And we've got it down to a point now where we can cook a Bobby Flay filet mignon steak in six minutes to perfect temp every time. We can cook pasta without any water, sautéed, al dente. We can cook a pizza in 88 seconds, Chinese food without a wok. Like we've really invented something. Mm-hmm. Um and I think, you know, it's allowed us to, to really create an elevated home dining experience. Yeah. What about from a price standpoint? Obviously, when you look at the economics of a lot of these like delivery companies like DoorDash and, and Postmates, it just, it doesn't, um, it's a lot. It's expensive to always, like every day if you're ordering from one of these, you're, you're yeah. spending a lot of money on food. Do you see that in, in terms of the economics of wonder that over time you can reduce the cost to the consumer of getting quality food or is yeah, it just, is it just a no, new norm absolutely. that you have to get used to? No, yeah. being vertically integrated, you know, being able to get the full margin of cooking the food, the full margin of the restaurant and the full margin of delivery. Um, but then also the benefit of the fact that you own both the cooking and the delivery, there's a lot of synergies there to take costs out of the system. For example, when we cook, if you ordered four different restaurants for four people in the family, all that food will finish cooking at the same time. It'll immediately go into a hot bag and we'll time the cooking with the courier. So your food never sits and the curry never sits. And mm-hmm. so that integration not only helps you get the food hotter and faster, but at a lower cost. And so it, it's quite profitable to be vertically integrated. And we share those profits with customers by lowering prices. And so that Bobby Flay steak is $32 on Wonder. That same steak is $55 in the restaurant. And on the delivery aggregators, it might get marked up 10 or 15%. It might be $65 or $60 um, online. What do you see? What do you see as the future of that? Like you mentioned, like, you know, it's more expensive in the restaurant because obviously there's labor and, um, you know, the rent and all that kind of stuff baked into it. But like, do you, do you see that over time, assuming like, you know, in the perfect world, like wonder, is as big as you hope it to be. Right. And like everyone's doing ordering this, do do you see like restaurants uh, still having like a place in the world? Yeah. I don't think, I don't think we're competing with restaurants necessarily. I think 
were competing with that one or two nights a week that you were going to cook that now you're ordering in and and that's it. So I think yeah. it will take a share of the growing food delivery market for sure. Like that market is a hundred billion. Now it was zero 13, 14 years ago. Um, and we expect it to go to 500 billion, um, you know, by 2036. So mm. it's growing very fast and there's certainly a lot of share that's going to be up for grabs. And we think we've got a compelling value prop. It's, it's cheaper, faster, hotter, higher quality, more on time, more accurate. Like it's it's just a it's a really um, good good experience. We've got eleven locations open now in the in the New York metro area, but over the next eighteen months, our plan is to open up eighty locations. So hmm. we're really starting to uh, go into hyper growth mode right now. Love it. Any plans for LA? Not yet. Not yet. All those eighty are going to be. For the most part, in tri-state, and then we'll start working up and down the northeast. But it'll be it'll be quite some time before we get out of the northeast. Yeah, years. So, so to sort of like encompass all this. Speaking of your mindset um, and your sort of approach to entrepreneurship and this like contrarianism that you've had, uh, you've talked about your sort of theory of like putting the cart before the horse. Can you share a little bit more yeah. about that? I just think uh, as, as an entrepreneur, I mean, you, you're taught don't put the cart in front of the horse. I think as an entrepreneur, you have to do that. You know, you're doing that all the time because by putting the cart in front of the horse, you kind of like are able to flush out and learn and get answers um, that allow you to dictate the correct strategy going forward. Thinking about like all these different ventures that you've started and they're they're all in somewhat different industries, right? What would you say is like your overall goal in life like what what does a like because and I, I would be just like you like <laughs> this like ma maximizer mentality of like okay i've reached this point in my life okay what's the next point and what's the next point and what's the, how can i just like get better and better and better but i'm just curious like do you have this overall sense of what success is to you like at, let's say at the end of your life you're looking back like I, i'm i'd be happy if i did this if i accomplished this yeah i mean it's, I don't have a, a specific goal per se. I think, you know, I, I like to say, you know, like my personal mission, what, you know, what drives me is, you know, living life, loving deeply and changing the world. Like that, that's sort of my, 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 my sort of personal mission statement. And so I sort of, you know, if I'm doing one of those three things, I'm happy. And at the end of the day, it is about being, being happy and, and giving back, you know? And, and so I don't know. I don't have a clear vision for my life. Like I want to accomplish X, Y, and Z. I just want to be a good person. I want to enjoy life. I want to give back. I want to make people happy. Um, and I want to put my mark on the world, you know, change it in, 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 in a little way that I, that I can. That's really it. I don't know how that's going to, you know, right now with wonder, um, you know, I think the big vision is to create a super app for mealtime. Anytime you want to eat a meal, um, you can pull up Wonder and and get food any which way you want it, and be able to create a meal plan, be able to within a budget, um, you know, lay out the meals for the week, tell you your health score, you know, be able to give you advice on things you can do to have a better diet, to be healthier. Like, there's lots of ways that you can take Wonder uh, in the future that is super motivating for me. That really could, you know, again make a positive impact on the world. Um, not just, you know, better quality food, but also better overall life experience and, 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 and health. I love it. Well, this has been an absolute uh, pleasure, Mark. You know, you, you are an entrepreneur's entrepreneur, and I think the world needs more people like you to, to sort of have these moonshot ideas and, and really go after them. And, and there's so many obviously problems in the world that could be solved through entrepreneurship and uh, just, you know, I hope that more and more people listening to your story could be inspired to, to go out and, you know, do their part and, and help change the world for the better. But I appreciate the time. Hopefully we can meet in person someday, uh, someday soon. But it's been a, a blast. Yeah, thank you. It's been a blast. Uh, thank you so much for having me on and uh, have a great night. Thanks, Mark. You too.